Ron Malden. I'm the creator of Gorilla Reeves, the online video literary magazine, and I am here at a sneak preview of the new Dinosaur Hall at the Los Angeles County Natural History Museum. And I wanted to read a little piece that, um, of literature that is very appropriate to this particular location. Um, and I thought, who better to talk about dinosaurs in literature but James Mitchell? I'm going to read a segment from his book Centennial. And if you know his work, you probably know that um, he writes a lot about places, books, novels like Texas and Alaska and Hawaii. And this book traces the history of the plains of Northeast Colorado from the history to the 1970s. And as with many of his books, um, this traces that history all the way back to the primordial so we're going to a segment from Chapter 3, and it's called The Inhabitants. Night was closing in. The attack by the smaller dinosaur reminded her that she ought to be heading back toward the safety of the lagoon, back where 14 other reptiles formed a protective herd. But she was kept in the river by a vague moment. She had experienced several times an extremely small brain, barely large enough to send signals to the various remote parts of her body. For example, to activate her tail became a major tactical problem, for any signal originating in her distant head required some time to reach the affected muscles of the tail. It was the same with the ponderous legs. They could not be called into instant action. Her brain was too small and too undifferentiated to permit reasoning or memory. Habit and brain warned her of danger, and only ins the instinctive use of her tail protected her from the kind of assault she had just experienced. As for explaining in specific terms the gnawing agitation she now felt, and which had been the major reason for her leaving the safety of the herd, her small brain could give her no help. She therefore walked with splashing grace toward a spot some distance upstream. How beautiful she was as she moved through the growing darkness. All parts of her great body seemed to relate to one central impulse. Gently twisting neck, stalwart central structure, slow moving mighty legs, and delicate tail extending almost endlessly behind and balancing the whole. It would require far more than a hundred million years of experiment before her equal would be seen again. She was moving toward a white chalk cliff, which she had known before. It stood some distance in from the lagoon, sixty feet higher than the river at its feet. Here, back eddies had formed a swamp, and as she approached this protected area, Diplodocus became aware of a sense of security. She hunched her shoulders again and adjusted her hips. Moving her long tail with graceful arcs, she tested the edge of the swamp with one massive forefoot. Liking what she felt, she moved slowly forward, sinking deeper and deeper into the dark waters until she was totally submerged, except for the knobby tip of her head, which she left exposed so that she could breathe. She did not fall asleep as she should have done. The gnawing in satiety kept her awake, even though she could feel the new stone working on the foliage she had consumed that day, and even though the buzzing of the day insects had ceased, indicating that night was at hand. She wanted to sleep, but could not. So after some hours, the tiny brain sent signals along the extended nerve system, and she pulled herself through the swamp with her noisy sucking sounds. Soon, she was back at the main channel, still hunting vaguely for something she could neither define nor locate. And so, she spent the long tropical night. James Michener's Centennial, here in the new dinosaur hall at Los Angeles County National History Museum.